Welcome to the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we finally finish our series on the origins of life. Last topic we have to cover is prokaryotic diversification. So let me get you your objectives and we'll go ahead and get this over with. Two things I need you to know by the end of this video. First of all, relate rapid reproduction to prokaryotic diversity. And then finally, compare and contrast prokaryotic gene recombination strategies. So topic for the day is how prokaryotes, even though they don't go through sexual reproduction, have so much diversity within their ranks. I mean, as we know in most of the living world, the way you get genetic diversity is taking some genetic material from mom, some from dad, mixing it together, and you get a new combination. But prokaryotes don't go through sexual reproduction. They go through binary fission, which is where one prokaryote essentially divides into two, causing, like, creating duplicate copies of itself. So that doesn't look like a system that would lead to very much diversity. Problem is, or not problem, I guess for prokaryotes to benefit, in every genome there is a pretty specific rate or constant rate of, I guess, mutation. Mutations, gra or mutations accumulate with a certain amount of frequency. Sorry, words are hard there for a second. So in organisms like humans that reproduce, you know, we've got a generation time of two to three years, and most of us don't start reproducing until at the very, very minimum, you know, 15, 16 years of age. We reproduce very slowly. It takes a long time to go from one generation of humans to the next. So if you've got a few mutations in the genome of a human, it might take a long time to get something that actually causes a change in the phenotype of the human. There could be silent mutations or things like that that don't really show up. So they're not a big deal, they just kind of get carried on. And those mutations aren't going to accumulate very rapidly because you're not going through generations very rapidly. In something like prokaryote that has a generation time of possibly, you know, an hour, you can speed through hundreds of generations, maybe even in a couple of days. So because prokaryotes reproduce so rapidly, those mutations that are still very rare, you know, maybe one or two per 10 million genes, because, you know, the mutations are rare, but the reproduction is happening so quickly, those mutations can accumulate very rapidly within the genome of a prokaryote. Let me sum all that mess up because words were hard this morning. Prokaryotes reproduce rapidly. Because they reproduce so rapidly, though mutations are rare, their rapid reproduction allows those mutations to happen more frequently, which means that those mutations can cause change in the phenotype of the prokaryote more quickly than we see in other organisms. Let's move on to another topic. Rest of the video, we're going to talk about genetic recombination because prokaryotes do have some strategies for coming up with genetic novelties that aren't the result of mutations. So I'm going to go through those and then we're going to be done for the day. First strategy is transformation, and I titled this Don't Eat That because I feel like, you know, little kids, they put anything in their mouth. Prokaryotes have kind of got a similar habit in that you can see up here in the top corner, there is, well, first of all, here's our prokaryote. There's all kinds of genetic material floating around this prokaryote. So let's say another prokaryote has just lysed and released all of its genetic material all over the place. There are pieces of genetic material called plasmids. They are little rings. They look like that. Prokaryotes are very prone to taking in floor, um, foreign plasmids. So if they've got some genetic material floating around them, it's very possible they will take in the plasmid from another prokaryote. That prokaryote may be of their species. It may not. But they've got mechanisms that allow them to take in those um, plasmids into their cell, and then they can actually start expressing the genes that are on those plasmids. So they might suddenly come up with a very novel phenotype. Some prokaryotes have even got surface receptors on their outside that allow them to recognize foreign DNA that is similar in species. So they know, hey, this might be something good that I can take in. So they're not having sex with another prokaryote. They're simply taking in foreign DNA that's floating around and then expressing the genes off of that foreign DNA. We've also got a situation called transduction. We talked about bacteriophages. Those are viruses that infect a bacteria. If you remember when a virus infects a bacteria, the virus injects its DNA and then causes the bacteria to start reproducing more viruses. If something gets screwed up in the copying of that genetic material, it's possible that what the uh, bacteria ends up making are 
part virus, part bacteria. So you might end up with the viral coat of the virus, but it could have genes from the bacteria on the inside, which means it's no longer virulent. It's just carrying some genes from the bacteria. So if that virus that has got the genes from the bacteria goes along and infects another bacterial cell, you have just had genetic transfer from one cell to the other through the bacteria or through the virus that moved from one cell to the next. You also have a situation called conjugation. Now, bacteria are able to, some bacteria, are able to form a novel little structure called the sex pillus. That would be this little guy right here. Sex pillus works kind of like a grappling hook. So only certain bacteria are able to make these. The bacteria that are able to make it have a gene or they are known as being F positive for fertile positive. So let's say this guy is F positive, he creates a sex pillus that goes out, it attaches to this bacteria, and then like a grappling hook, it pulls it back. Now this sex pillus is hollow, so once these two cells are attached or near each other, this guy can take his plasmid, send that plasmid through the sex pillus, and suddenly this guy has picked up a new and novel plasmid. Let's say that this one sent an F plus uh, plasmid from himself, to this one, this bacteria would suddenly become an F plus bacteria, which means it could go on and make sex pili to attach to other bacteria. Um, in this situation, one bacteria is always the donor, one is the recipient. You don't have um, plasmids being pushed back and forth. You've got a flow of information going in one direction. Finally, last thing, here's the end of our video. Um, with plasmids in bacteria, we talk about two types. There are probably multiple types of bacteria, but there's two that I want you to be aware of. There's an F plasmid and an R plasmid. F plasmids are the ones that produce or give a bacteria the ability to become fertile, to make that sex pillus that allows it to attach to and add genetic material to other bacteria. So that's an F plasmid. R plasmids are plasmids that confer antibiotic resistance to bacteria. So when we were talking about MRSA and other uh, antibiotic resistant diseases, those bacteria have an R plasmid, and that R plasmid can be transferred from one bacteria to the next. So it's possible that you've got a resistant bacteria sending its R plasmids over to other bacteria, conferring upon them uh, resistance to whatever bacteria that you are dealing with. Last term that I just thought of that I didn't have in my slides, you need to know the term horizontal gene transfer, and that is the process by which a bacteria takes in foreign material or foreign uh, genetic material. So just stick that term in the back of your head. That's it. Origins of Life series is finished. Thanks for joining us. My name's Mr. Kite. This is a Lab 207 webcast. Hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.